A notable form of faith arises out of assured knowledge. This comes of growth in grace, and is the faith which believes Christ because it knows him, and trusts him because it has proved him to be infallibly faithful. An old Christian was in the habit of writing T and P in the margin of her Bible whenever she had tried and proved a promise. How easy it is to trust a tried and proved Savior. You cannot do this as yet, but you will do so. Everything must have a beginning. You will rise to strong faith in due time. This mature faith asks not for signs and tokens, but bravely believes. Look at the faith of the Master Mariner. I have often wondered at it. He loses his cable. He steams away from the land. For days, weeks, or even months, he never sees sail or shore. Yet on he goes day and night without fear, till one morning he finds himself exactly opposite to the desired haven toward which he has been steering. How has he found his way over the trackless deep? He has trusted his compass, his nautical almanac, his glass, and the heavenly bodies, and obeying their guidance, without sighting land, he has steered so accurately that he has not to change a point to enter into port. It is a wonderful thing, that sailing or steaming without sight. Spiritually it is a blessed thing to leave altogether the shores of sight and feeling, and to say good-bye to inward feelings, cheering providences, signs, tokens, and so forth. It is glorious to be far out on the ocean of divine love, believing in God, and steering for heaven straight away by the direction of the word of God. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. To them shall be administered an abundant entrance at the last, and a safe voyage on the way. Will not my reader put his trust in God, in Christ Jesus? There I rest with joyous confidence. Brother, come with me, and believe our Father and our Savior. Come at once. Alas, I can do nothing. After the anxious heart has accepted the doctrine of atonement, and learned the great truth that salvation is by faith in the Lord Jesus, it is often sore troubled with a sense of inability toward that which is good. Many are groaning, I can do nothing. They are not making this into an excuse, but they feel it as a daily burden. They would if they could. They can each one honestly say, To will is present with me, but how to perform that which I would, I find not. This feeling seems to make all the gospel null and void. For what is the use of food to a hungry man if he cannot get at it? Or what avail is the river of the water of life if one cannot drink? We recall the story of the doctor and the poor woman's child. The sage practitioner told the mother that her little one would soon be better under proper treatment, but it was absolutely needful that her boy should regularly drink the best wine, and that he should spend a season at one of the German spas. This, to a widow who could hardly get bread to eat. Now, it sometimes seems to the troubled heart that the simple gospel of believe and live is not, after all, so very simple. For it asks the poor sinner to do what he cannot do. To the really awakened, but half instructed, there appears to be a missing link. Yonder is the salvation of Jesus, but how is it to be reached? The soul is without strength, and knows not what to do. It lies within sight of the city of refuge, and cannot enter its gate. Is this want of strength provided for in the plan of salvation? It is. The work of the Lord is perfect. It begins where we are, and asks nothing of us in order to its completion. When the good Samaritan saw the traveller lying wounded and half dead, he did not bid him rise and come to him, and mount the ass and ride off to the inn. No, he came where he was, and ministered to him, and lifted him upon the beast and bore him to the inn. Thus doth the Lord Jesus deal with us in our low and wretched estate. We have seen that God justifieth, that he justifieth the ungodly, and that he justifies them through faith in the precious blood of Jesus. We have now to see the condition these ungodly ones are in when Jesus works out their salvation. Many awakened persons are not only troubled about their sin, but about their moral weakness. They have no strength with which to escape from the mire into which they have fallen, 
nor to keep out of it in after days. They not only lament over what they have done, but over what they cannot do. They feel themselves to be powerless, helpless, and spiritually lifeless. It may sound odd to say that they feel dead, and yet it is even so. They are, in their own esteem, to all good, incapable. They cannot travel the road to heaven, for their bones are broken. None of the men of strength have found their hands. In fact, they are without strength. Happily, it is written, as the commendation of God's love to us, When we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Romans 5, 6 Here we see conscious helplessness succored, succored by the interposition of the Lord Jesus. Our helplessness is extreme. It is not written, when we were comparatively weak, Christ died for us, or when we had only a little strength. But the description is absolute and unrestricted. When we were yet without strength, we had no strength whatever which could aid in our salvation. Our Lord's words were emphatically true. Without me, ye can do nothing. I may go further than the text, and remind you of the great love wherewith the Lord loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins. To be dead is even more than to be without strength. The one thing that the poor, strengthless sinner has to fix his mind upon, and firmly retain, as his one ground of hope, is the divine assurance that, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Believe this, and all inability will disappear. As it is fabled of Midas that he turned everything into gold by his touch, so it is true of faith that it turns everything it touches into good. Our very needs and weaknesses become blessings when faith deals with them. Let us dwell upon certain forms of this want of strength. To begin with, one man will say, Sir, I do not seem to have strength to collect my thoughts and keep them fixed upon those solemn topics which concern my salvation. A short prayer is almost too much for me. It is so partly, perhaps, through natural weakness, partly because I have injured myself through dissipation, and partly also because I worry myself with worldly cares, so that I am not capable of those high thoughts which are necessary ere a soul can be saved. This is a very common form of sinful weakness. Note this. You are without strength on this point, and there are many like you. They could not carry out a train of consecutive thought to save their lives. Many poor men and women are illiterate and untrained, and these would find deep thought to be very heavy work. Others are so light and trifling by nature that they could no more follow out a long process of argument and reasoning than they could fly. They could never attain to the knowledge of any profound mystery if they expended their whole life in the effort. You need not, therefore, despair. That which is necessary to salvation is not continuous thought, but a simple reliance upon Jesus. Hold you on to this one fact. In due time Christ died for the ungodly. This truth will not require from you any deep research or profound reasoning or convincing argument. There it stands. In due time Christ died for the ungodly. Fix your mind on that and rest there. Let this one great, gracious, glorious fact lie in your spirit till it perfumes all your thoughts, and makes you rejoice even though you are without strength. Seeing the Lord Jesus has become your strength and your song, yea, he has become your salvation. According to the scriptures, it is a revealed fact that in due time Christ died for the ungodly when they were yet without strength. You have heard these words hundreds of times, maybe, and yet you have never before perceived their meaning. There is a cheering savor about them, is there not? Jesus did not die for our righteousness, but he died for our sins. He did not come to save us because we were worth the saving, but because we were utterly worthless, ruined, and undone. He came not to earth out of any reason that was in us, but solely and only out of reasons which he fetched from the depths of his own divine love. In due time, he died for those whom he describes not as godly, but as ungodly, 
applying to them as hopeless an adjective as he could well have selected. If you have but little mind, yet fasten it to this truth, which is fitted to the smallest capacity, and is able to cheer the heaviest heart, let this text lie under your tongue like a sweet morsel, till it dissolves into your heart and flavors all your thoughts, and then it will little matter though those thoughts should be as scattered as autumn leaves. Persons who have never shown in science, nor displayed the least originality of mind, have nevertheless been fully able to accept the doctrine of the cross, and have been saved thereby. Why should not you? I hear another man cry, O oh, sir, my want of strength lies mainly in this, that I cannot repent sufficiently. A curious idea men have of what repentance is. Many fancy that so many tears are to be shed, and so many groans are to be heaved, and so much despair is to be endured. Whence comes this unreasonable notion? Unbelief and despair are sins, and therefore I do not see how they can be constituent elements of acceptable repentance. Yet there are many who regard them as necessary parts of true Christian experience. They are in great error. Still, I know what they mean, for in the days of my darkness I used to feel the same way. I desired to repent, but I thought that I could not do it, and yet all the while I was repenting. Odd as it may sound, I felt that I could not feel. I used to get into a corner and weep, because I could not weep, and I fell into bitter sorrow, because I could not sorrow for sin. What a jumble it all is, when in our unbelieving state we begin to judge our own condition. It is like a blind man looking at his own eyes. My heart was melted within me for fear, because I thought that my heart was as hard as an adamant stone. My heart was broken to think that it would not break. Now I can see that I was exhibiting the very thing which I thought I did not possess. But then I knew not where I was. Oh, that I could help others into the light which I now enjoy! Fain would I say a word that might shorten the time of their bewilderment. I would say a few plain words, and pray the Comforter to apply them to the heart. Remember that the man who truly repents is never satisfied with his own repentance. We can no more repent perfectly than we can live perfectly. However pure our tears, there will always be some dirt in them. There will be something to be repented of even in our best repentance. But listen, to repent is to change your mind about sin, and Christ, and all the great things of God. There is sorrow implied in this, but the main point is the turning of the heart from sin to Christ. If there be this turning, you have the essence of true repentance, even though no alarm and no despair should ever have cast their shadow upon your mind. If you cannot repent as you would, it would greatly aid you to do so if you will firmly believe that in due time Christ died for the ungodly. I think of this again and again. How can you continue to be hard-hearted when you know that out of supreme love Christ died for the ungodly? Let me persuade you to reason with yourself thus. Ungodly as I am, though this heart of steel will not relent, though I smite in vain upon my breast, yet he died for such as I am, since he died for the ungodly. Oh, that I may believe this and feel the power of it upon my flinty heart! Blot out every other reflection from your soul, and sit down by the hour together, and meditate deeply on this one resplendent display of unmerited, unexpected, unexampled love. Christ died for the ungodly. Read over carefully the narrative of our Lord's death, as you find it in the four evangelists. If anything can melt your stubborn heart, it will be a sight of the sufferings of Jesus, and the consideration that he suffered all this for his enemies. O Jesus, sweet the tears I shed, while at thy feet I kneel. Gaze on thy wounded, fainting head, and all thy sorrows feel. My heart dissolves to see thee bleed, this heart so hard before. I hear thee, for the guilty plead, and grief o'erflows the more. Twas for the sinful thou didst die, and I a sinner stand, convinced by thine expiring eye, slain by thy pierced hand. 